Um, so I'm gonna really just talk about the, the developments uh, in the last two years specific, uh, from, from basically predominantly transport data, which we had uh, taken in our, our, our group. And I will really touch base on uh, the superconducting correlated uh, and magnetic phases, which we observe uh, in, in our twisted bilayer graphene devices. And first of all, uh, I want to thank the group. So um, um, the work was done predominantly by uh, postdoc Shavuhu. Uh, he was the final for the CPS. And uh, I'm also very grateful for theory collaborations uh, by Alan McDonald and the Bernabeu to learn into detail. And uh, really just, uh, uh, okay, I, I, I really, I really, really uh, I didn't know exactly what, what the sort of um, sort of background of the people um, who are, are attending going to be, but I, I wanted to give like a ten to fifteen minute uh, introduction to ray materials and twisted bilayer graphene and to flat band physics, uh, etc. Uh, then I will predominantly talk about the transport results from uh, our own group uh, and really um, uh, mostly uh, concentrate on the superconducting um, uh, and uh, the correlated insulator phases and. Uh, really, uh, just to start very slow, so I think uh, um, the field of graphene really exists for uh, now 15 years. Uh, however, from the very beginning, from, from the time when Andre Game and Kostin Vasilev extracted graphene, um, uh, people were really wondering whether this uh, exceptional material can also host uh, in, uh, interacting uh, electron phases. And really, I think until uh, two, two or three years ago, um, graphene was rather poor uh, on these phases. So and mostly everything was described by the single particle picture. However, of course, there were a lot of uh, predictions uh, early on. And then, of course, the um, uh, big uh, breakthrough came by Pablo Cangro Guerrero uh, now two years ago, where he reported that in a new type of graphene called twisted bilayer graphene, where two sheets of carbon are basically rotated uh, with respect to one another. Uh, he observed signatures of um, uh, correlated insulators, and he also uh, reported on uh, superconductivity flanking these uh, uh, phases. And then uh, uh, this was uh, still not it. So there were uh, a year later, uh, the groups of David Gohan, Gordon, and Andre Young, they also reported that the system uh, also uh, contains magnetic phases and also uh, topological phases, uh, basically, they observed an almost quantum Hall effect. Uh, and we're really uh, quite excited to be in the field. And I also want to mention uh, the one of the really special things about this material is also that all these phases are kind of uh, living in the same device and are gate tunable uh, or, or between one another. So one can actually uh, have an extremely high level of control and one can tune between these phases up, uh, up and down. And this, of course, allows uh, new types of uh, sort of experiments which can be performed. And um, uh, really, uh, uh, to, to go sort of uh, very slow uh, uh, into that uh, field, so uh, really, I wanted to just to, to give a little bit of an um, overview of what happened the years before uh, this discovery. And again, it all, had, all started uh, by uh, um, by uh, the extraction of graphene. So, so in, in the group of uh, uh, under game, people realized that they can extract two dimensional, uh, perfectly two dimensional crystals from bulk crystals uh, if you do it in a Van der Waals uh, material. And they were able to sort of extract single layers of graphene uh, and deposit it on silicon oxide substrate. Then, of course, uh, through the years, people have learned to do this with many other materials. So, prominently, uh, hexagonal bore nitride, which is an insulator, people learned to extract single layers as well. And then, also, uh, this happened uh, mostly at Columbia uh, when I was there by um, uh, groups of Philip Kim, uh, Jim Hohen, and uh, Corey Dean were involved in this. Uh, people also learned to make these, uh, to stamp these two dimensional material on, on top of one another and to sort of assemble them vertically in these designer Van der Waals stacks. And so the surprise here was that um, these the interfaces formed by this sort of rather rude technique were still extremely good. So really, um, if you look at typical uh, transmission electron microscopy uh, um, uh, images uh, between hexagonal bar nitride graphene and LS2, you see that the interfaces are extremely good. Uh, and uh, what is also very special 
is that you can align the crystallographic orientations between the different layers, uh, and you can form these so-called Maurice upper lattices, which I will talk uh, in a second about. And really, I want to uh, contrast this uh, sort of um, these heterostructures uh, made by Van der Waals materials to heterostructures that were traditionally grown uh, throughout the years and decades uh, before that. Uh, and really, the difference is here that we uh, do not start with single atom species, which we sprinkle onto substrates. Uh, so, like in molecular demon petixi, uh, in these techniques, because you start with single uh, atoms, you kind of uh, guarantee that these atoms, when they, they enter, uh, they, they hit a, a particular surface, they align to the crystallographic orientation of that particular surface. So, so, so you cannot or orient uh, the crystallographic orientation, they're all kind of pointing in the same direction. And really, because in these Van der Waals heterostructures, we, we start with already preformed two dimensional crystals, we can actually align them uh, with any given orientation. and. Uh, uh, basically, this is a really uh, new and exciting uh, capability uh, of these Mandelbaum secular structures. Uh, and to highlight what's uh, really going on uh, in the physics when we do this uh, twisting, so I want to start just basically with a single uh, a sheet of graphene. This is again this uh, just two dimensional uh, hexagonal uh, lattice of atoms. Uh, if we do type binding calculations, we just get this rock cone uh, dispersion. Uh, uh, which is basically defined by, by the, uh, which is basically a result of those two equivalent um, uh, carbon atoms in the unit cell and a, and a gamma zero term, uh, which allows hopping between the, uh, these uh, uh, lattice sites. Then uh, uh, really what uh, dramatically uh, changes if you, we uh, look at AB bioactivine, so this is the sort of the typical uh, naturally occurring form of, uh, of graphene. Uh, where really one layer sits just uh, uh, on top of the other layer of, of graphene. And here now, because we have these extra tunneling terms between uh, the, the layers, uh, the band structure becomes uh, dramatically renormalized and really the band structure at charge neutrality uh, is not anymore linear, but it has this parabolic dispersion relation. So basically really these tunneling terms, they have a strong effect uh, on the band structure. And of course, now, if we start rotating uh, these layers uh, one on top of another, these uh, hopping uh, terms are not anymore a good sort of, uh, they're not, they're not uh, fixed uh, um, for the whole device, but they're, uh, they're changing uh, periodically um, uh, with this Moray lattice, which is created uh, between the, the atoms. And really, so we, we can find, if we analyze uh, this Moray, Potentially, we will find regions where we have AA stacking of graphite, where really the carbon atoms just are directly one on top of another. And then, if we sort of move away from uh, these AA points and we, we have find regions of uh, AB stacked uh, graphene, where, where the top and bottom layer are slightly shifted uh, with respect to one another. And all of this sort of uh, induces different uh, tunneling terms between the layers. Uh, and uh, really, um, um, all of this uh, can uh, dramatically renormalize uh, the, the, the band structure in, in the system. Uh, and just to give like some uh, experimental uh, 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 sort of indications, the, uh, sort of early on indications of, of, of the system as such. So, so first of all, really, uh, these uh, marine uh, lattices are robust, so we can image them with scanning probe. Um, um, Technique. So, for example, this is an image uh, done by our collaborators Milan Allen in Leiden, and they were uh, able to just um, image with STM uh, and resolve a really periodic uh, Mori uh, superpotential. So, uh, all of these uh, sort of periodic um, uh, dots here, which you see, they're not uh, single atoms, but those are really this, these Mori lattice sites. Uh, and uh, secondly, so uh, as, as I mentioned, so the band structure becomes really strongly renormalized when we, when we go close to this uh, uh, so-called magic angle of one to one degree. So, so here um, uh, I show the theoretical band structure of uh, twisted by the graphene. If um, we, uh, uh, um, we consider a twist angle of 1.3 degrees, and what's uh, really striking is, of course, the Fermi surface gets extremely complicated but also uh, the 
the, the bands uh, basically break up into different sections and specifically at zero uh, energy, we get these ultra flat bands, which are separated by band gaps uh, to higher order uh, bands. And really this, this can be seen in nano arrows. So this is, this is, for example, experiments done by our collaborators, Philip Baumberger in Geneva. And really we can see those ultra bright uh, flat bands and also energy gaps forming uh, to, uh, to higher order um, uh, bands. And really, so basically, I think uh, for the remainder of the talk, so the system which we're really um, uh, uh, looking at uh, and when we, when we try to understand our uh, experiments, we really uh, try to look at a sort of this magic and graphene band structure where we have these ultra flat bands of around 10 MeV bandwidth, uh, which uh, are um, uh, isolated by larger band gaps to, um, more, uh, to dispersive bands at higher energies. And because these bands are so flat, uh, the kinetic energy is almost zero uh, for the electrons, and they basically uh, stop moving and lock into place. And of course, also um, this means because energy, kinetic energy is quenched, that uh, interactions uh, take over uh, the, the physics, uh, the physics of, uh, here. And also what, what I also want to mention is, and I will come back later on in a little bit more detail to that, also uh, these flat bands uh, are, are now found to be topologically non-trivial. So because um, the newly formed Boolean zones have uh, winding numbers which are um, uh, non-zero, uh, it is basically impossible to, uh, local, uh, to find localized binary function solutions for, for, uh, for uh, the, the orbitals here. And uh, really, uh, um, basically, uh, one has to think of uh, these bands as kind of a sum of uh, uh, churn bands, which are which have uh, different churn numbers, and we'll talk about this uh, later on uh, as well. So let me start just with the experiment. So really, the experiment which we're doing uh, are relatively. So I mean, once we have the device, the experiment is is not actually so difficult. So we just measure resistance as a function of carrier density, and um, basically uh, uh, we basically sweep the Fermi energy. Uh, from a completely empty uh, Moray band, uh, and we sweep the Fermi energy through it until we completely fill it. And so, basically, as you see, so the uh, carrier density changes orders of magnitude when we do so. So, um, first of all, uh, when we start in, in this sort of uh, lower energy gap, uh, we, we find this uh, robust insulating state. Also, when we completely fill um, the, uh, um, the band structure, um, we, we find an energy gap. In the middle, we of course see this charge neutrality point. But, but as you can see, so there are many other features uh, here in the system which are not defined by this uh, single particle band structure, which we showed before. Uh, and in particular, those are these uh, correlated insulating states which appear at exactly integer filling of uh, electrons per meridian itself. So uh, uh, um, basically, exactly when we fill. Uh, one electron, two electrons, or three electrons into the system. Uh, and these features, uh, they're again, not explained by a single particle picture, but they're really much better explained uh, by a sort of a naive assumption that we deal here with a modern slate uh, picture, uh, where really um, uh, 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 electrons like to localize at different uh, lattice sites. Um, and where um, um, kinetic energy is given just by the, the hopping between hopping term between uh, neighboring lattice sites, and of course also we need to consider the pool of energy, which um, kind of um, prohibits or makes it unfavorable for two electrons to sit in a single uh, lattice site. So in that picture, of course, uh, we um, uh, we um, um, uh, if, if if really u is much bigger than t. Uh, and we have we deal with a fully occupied um, uh, lattice uh, site, so we have integer numbers of uh, electrons per lattice site. Then, of course, we form uh, energy gaps, uh, and we polarize the bands uh, with uh, uh, with respect uh, to um, uh, to this uh, to this energy gap. And I also want to mention, so I, I mentioned this before. So in graphene, we have. Um, uh, a fourfold degeneracy, so we have electrons, uh, uh, sorry, we have spins and value degrees of freedom. So in principle, whenever we polarize the bands and form an energy, uh, uh, a, mod, a mod gap here, 
We also, of course, create some sort of symmetry in the problem. So we, we in principle, can polarize the system with respect to value or with respect to spin and, and uh, uh, form basically um, uh, um, um, some sort of um, uh, magnetic, ferromagnetic states in this SU4 phase space, uh, which is given by uh, very, very space. And I will, I will touch base of, about this uh, much later. And then the other thing, of course, which was uh, very striking, uh, which was observed in the very beginning by Pablo, was that uh, really when you uh, sort of look at the temperature uh, dependence uh, of uh, uh, these uh, resistance measurements, there are also regions where resistance just drops to zero. And this is, this is uh, shown here. So basically red are regions of high resistance and blue are regions of low resistance. So, so basically the insulators I talked to, uh, to about a second ago are these red regions. And you can see uh, flanking these red regions, there are a lot of blue regions uh, where superconducting domes uh, are observed. And uh, the, the way we sort of characterize those superconductors are typically uh, by doing all the sort of uh, checks and balances one, one needs to uh, consider here. So first of all, we really observe a zero resistance state. So resistance goes uh, to zero. Uh, and uh, if you look at, for example, the temperature dependence of the resistance here, we really can clearly define RTC. And TC in the system is typically in the orders of a uh, few Kelvin. Uh, then of course, uh, we can apply a critical uh, magnetic field and we can see that uh, these uh, superconducting states uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, are uh, disappear again, uh, and we can define a critical magnetic field, which is in the orders of um, uh, hundreds of millitesla. Uh, of course, we observe also uh, nonlinear conductance and critical uh, currents uh, in, in the system here. And again, here, critical currents are in the orders of uh, 10 to 100 nanoamps. And I think uh, the, the so far, really, the smoking gun evidence uh, which really um, uh, leaves a little room for uh, alternative interpretations, really, that in most devices we observe Fraunhoff interference patterns. So we have like really coherent Josephson junction coupling uh, in the device if there is a weak link created somewhere um, that, that interrupts the superconductor. And, and here from these measurements, we can, um, and actually from magnetic field measurements, we can extract also the coherence length of the superconductor, which is usually in the order of 50 nanometers, so it's in the order of several uh, uh, lattice constants of the void. Okay, and, and, and really, um, I think this superconducting state created probably the most excitement. So uh, really, uh, the excitement came from uh, several uh, kind of um, uh, uh, peculiarities of this uh, superconductor. So first of all, it's the thinnest possible superconductor. So you can, I mean, uh, there's really, it holds the record for the thinnest superconductor, it's 0.6 uh, nanometers uh, only in uh, thickness. So, so this is basically showing thickness of uh, various different superconductors. So matching the thinnest really at the bottom here. And then also it is by far the lowest carrier density superconductor. So the superconducting uh, state uh, basically is formed from a very low carrier density uh, of electrons. Uh, and, and really this shows, uh, this graph here, uh, this axis shows the carrier density here. And you can see, so the carrier density of magic and graphene is, for example, three orders of magnitude lower than viscor, the the selenide. So it's really uh, special just by the, by, by the sort of um, uh, uh, numbers it has. However, uh, uh, TC here is not so low, actually. TC is still uh, really sizable. So I think uh, the highest TC we observed so far was five Kelvin. Uh, and really, if one looks at the sort of TC ratio uh, uh, and the Fermi temperature ratio, it's really extremely high, and it's really only comparable to other, otherwise only comparable to appropriate superconductors. It's orders of magnitude larger than conventional superconductors like aluminum or aluminum. And of course, last but not least, of course, what what caught also a lot of attention is the phase diagram uh, um, uh, of. Um, uh, which kind of, uh, if um, uh, naively, looks also very similar to uh, the Cook rates, where again uh, the superconnect we observe superconducting domes upon doping of uh, correlated uh, insulator phases. Dimitri, and, yep. Do you have uh, any estimation of the value of the U from experiments? 
because yeah. this will so, also allow you to distinguish between this mod X scenario and other alternatives. Right, exactly. So, um, so uh, okay, from transport, uh, we cannot really directly measure you, but I think from STM, Sali Azdani, uh, he reports 25 MEV for, for the EU. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, sorry, Dmitri, this is Antoine. Uh, so, in connection with Angel, uh, the question uh, there is you, but there is also longer range Coulomb, right? So, what do we know about uh, how fast in space the, is the, the Coulomb interaction screened here? Mm -hmm. Or the screening length, if you want. Right, I think. Okay, I will. I will. I wanted to talk about screening in a second, but we, we actually okay, sure. will talk okay. about. We'll actually talk not about in-plane screening. Okay, so that's a good question. So I think I thought I'll come back to. But I will talk not about in-plane screening, but I will talk out-of-plane screening. Uh, but in-plane screen, I, I'm I'm not exactly sure right now. But it it it, it could be several lattice constants actually. I think it's not so quick. But but I'm not I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure to be honest. So the Hubbard model is a good uh, thing to have in mind, but it's probably not a realistic, quite yeah. realistic description. I also want to mention so what what I what I uh, presented before was kind of uh, was kind of like a toy model for for us to start thinking about the problem, and of course it's not like. It's not like a detailed model which you want to assume here in the, in the system. It's just really an introductory sort of fair model. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. So and obviously, also, obviously, obviously, for somebody who's working on the Hubbard model, this is not meant. This is not meant to, to be. Uh, uh, yeah, as simple. Um, no, also because uh, I think it's building on this question also of the long range uh, screening, which I think is important. Yeah. And also the ratio of u and t, because the t in this case is also not much <clears throat> smaller than the, the u. Right. 20 millivs and that is 10. Right, right, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, um, and um, right, and so and actually this brings me also to the next point. So basically I think um, what I, um, what I uh, wanted to talk about next is really um, the control of U versus T. So I think uh, you mentioned the details, maybe U, U and T are not actually that far off, but I think uh, um, uh, I want to really to emphasize that uh, also here we have entirely new capabilities to control these parameters. And I really uh, want to uh, kind of compare again uh, how special the system is because it's really uh, sits exactly in the intermediate sort of length scales compared to crystals and compared to optical lattices. And, um, and, and the specialty here is really that they're really, uh, as I will explain in a second, they're really new ways to uh, manipulate the system uh, because really the lattice constant here is 10 nanometers and not angstroms like in cuprates, uh, like uh, crystals, or it's not microns like in the optical lattices. So they're really new type of manipulations uh, which we can perform if you assume this, uh, this uh, novel uh, length scale. Uh, and uh, really this uh, plays uh, a, a huge role if we now start considering the details of the device, uh, uh, devices which we make. And, and again, uh, I'll, I'll come back just for, for analogy to the to this simplistic uh, um, Hubbard model uh, here. And I really just wanted to mention that really all these parameters like T and U, they're not, um, they're not fixed in, in our problem. So first of all, T is a tun tuning, tunable parameter. So T is a function of twist angle. So that on magic angle, T is of course the lowest. So we, T is, uh, um, uh, uh, has a minimal, but whenever we go slightly away from the magic angle, T becomes much bigger. So the bandwidth uh, of a 1.2 degree uh, twisted by a thin device is already 10 times bigger. So it's already like more like 100 MeV. So, so we can really uh, accurately control uh, T by just slightly changing the twist angle, but also we can, we can really control U in the problem. So because as I mentioned, so um, our devices are actually 
uh, in a very um, embedded into a very uh, non-trivial dielectric environment. So they're usually the twisted bilayer is encapsulated by HPN, which has a certain dielectric constant, but in principle, we can change that dielectric constant. Uh, and second of all, we usually have metallic gates close by to the, to the uh, plane of the magic angle thing. So, so as I will show in a second, so we have uh, typically graphite gates or gold gates, which are very sitting very close, which we typically use to control the carrier density, but also uh, uh, these graphite gates are really just a few nanometers away. So we can, in principle, use these graphite gates to screen out interactions uh, uh, out of plane. Uh, and, and really, um, um, so basically, uh, really the message here is that U versus T is a tuning parameter here. So you can control both T and U uh, separately. And uh, so, uh, and again, so this is uh, some calculations which Leonard Lemitov has done for us. This doesn't assume next and next and nearest neighbor screening, so really, really just next uh, uh, next neighbor screening uh, assumed here. But we were really wondering how uh, uh, U is affected by this uh, metallic layer, which is only a few nanometers away from it. And uh, really, uh, uh, we were wondering what is the length scale? How closely can we bring this uh, metallic graphite gate to the magic and graphene such that the screening uh, affects the U uh, in, a, in a more uh, pronounced way? Uh, and the, this is the calculation by Leonard. So here he calculates just U as a function of uh, this uh, gate distance. And really for above like 30 nanometer distance, we, we, we really don't observe any change, but, but with a length scale of around sort of characteristic length scale below 15 nanometers, U becomes really dramatically uh, screened out. And this length scale 15 nanometers is really just the size of this uh, Vanier function in the magic and graphene. So this is just the size of the meridian itself. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, uh, really this, this intermediate length scale so that we, we deal here with a system where the uh, 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 lattice uh, constant is uh, much, much bigger than in typical crystals. This allows us kind of new tricks and manipulations that we can uh, perform here. Uh, and I just um, sort of want to mention our experiment, which we performed here. So we really- okay. Yes, in the previous slide, sure. yes. Yes. if I take this argument of the, how the U is screened by the graphene layer underneath, which is metallic, right. Right. And if I do gating, basically you increase also the metallicity of the graphene layer, then you would expect that you also change with the gating yeah. that you yes. apply. Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, so there is, there is a, so I will, I will mention this in a second. There is a follow-up experiment uh, after our work came out uh, by GLE and Brown University. And they used this tunability effect. So they were able to sort of charge the, graph, the graphite gate and discharge it, okay. uh, effectively tuning the screening of the graphite gate. And they were able to see in a more, much more controlled way how the screening really uh, affects it. Okay. Um, uh, and it, it really, in a nutshell, so uh, I mean, um, before, before GLE uh, did this experiment, we, uh, we did ours where we really, uh, in a less controlled way, we, we really just made a bunch of devices uh, with different twist angles and different dielectric thicknesses. Uh, and really, um, um, we cannot in these experiments completely distinguish what's, what's more important, the screening or the sort of the bent, bent structure effect. We, we cannot completely disentangle it. But what's true is that in, in devices where twist angle is dead on magic angle and where the dielectric thickness is not, not a, that thin yet, we really strong, see strong correlated insulators. We really do, do see strong correlated insulators. And in the devices where, again, the parameters were shifted, where we don't, are, where the kinetic energy is enhanced and also where the dielectric uh, screening is, uh, is relatively strong, we, we don't see correlated insulators. So, so somehow really this proves the point that the correlated insulators can be quenched uh, uh, with these manipulations. And then in the work of GLE, again, he were, was able really to show in, a, in the same device, you know, really by changing this sort of tunable screening layer, 
he was able to show that this is really, that the correlated insulators are strongly affected by this field. Uh, and then, I mean, really, this is very, very interesting, this uh, tunability of the screening by your gating. So uh, my question is, uh, what is the direct experimental probe that one actually is changing the in layer screening? And is there any way to actually uh, measure this directly? And you know, this, this curve of U versus uh, gate or something that you were showing, this is a presumably a theory curve or what, what is this? Uh, so, right, so, okay, so uh, in, um, in what we measure in um, uh, transport, we can only measure temperature dictation of some sort of energy gap. So, uh, in, this is uh, always underestimating the, the sort of the gap which is uh, performed. Uh, what, um, uh, so it, it really, in my experiments here, we, we only, um, we only could extract the gap in an unscreened device, and we can uh, try to extract the gap through, through temperature activation in a, in a screen device. I see. But this is rather uh, uh, rough. What uh, uh, Ali Yazdani, so I know that Ali Yazdani is also trying to look at these screen devices. They can, of course, be much more, with SCM, they can extract these, these gaps in a much more controlled way. Mm -hmm. I think I think uh, we're really early on in these experiments. I think there's there are more, more experiment, more detailed experiments which will happen. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Hi, uh, I also have a question here. So we can see in the first picture that the superconducting dome is also increasing as we decrease the thickness. And what do you think? Like, is the reason for that? Is it because the yeah. correlated insulator decrease and superconducting increase? Or so it seems it seems that indeed it seems that like in this curve here you would expect a correlated insulator uh, uh, in the middle here of the superconducting dome, and it seems that indeed once the uh, correlated insulator disappears, the superconductivity takes over that phase space where the the correlated insulator appeared, um, and um, uh, right, and then of course, the, the, I guess the other part of your question is what does it mean? Why does it, uh, so th there seems to be a competition between the insulating phase and the, uh, and the superconducting phase. Uh, and I think this is still a debate what it means. I think I, think, uh, I heard um, uh, different arguments. Of course, one argument would be that uh, it's really just, I mean, if you look at this, um, uh, uh, whenever sort of the, the insulator disappears, the correlation don't disappear. So it's just like really the, that, that we don't observe and transport a, 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 a gap. But the correlations might remain uh, there and therefore uh, they, you know, the superconductor is still, still can be linked to the correlations in the system. So I think one cannot really disentangle uh, superconductivity and correlations uh, here. Uh, of course, the other possibility is, which is also debated, was whether this 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 could explain also L, in a L, electron phonon uh, picture for the superconductivity. I think that would also be possible, but I think right now we're all leaning more still towards a correlation, unconventional type superconductivity picture. Well, of course, mm -hmm. of course, we don't know. Like because like if I think very naively, like if the interaction decreases. I think that maybe superconducting will also decrease, but uh, it looks like it's not the case. Right, I think uh, that's what we thought in the beginning, honestly. So when we were, we started this work, that um, that we would maybe to see that TC changes proportionally to the strength of the insulator. But I think um, talking then later on to um, corporate people, etc. I think uh, 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 I heard also arguments that you go basically from a um, from sort of a cuprate to more like to or to more from a cuprate to more like a pnictite sort of uh, picture because in a pnictite you don't need a insulator uh, to be the parent state it can be also like a correlated metal or so as far as, I mean but I think it's 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 one of the central questions to be honest uh, about the superconductivity here so uh, you know how does one one can uh, really explain it. Dimitri, Thank just you. Okay. sorry. One question: At which temperature you kill the correlated insulator? 
And if uh, around like uh, usually five to ten thousand. And then you go to a correlated metal, or which or you go to a normal metallic state in the right. I mean, this is again again from transport. I don't think we can distinguish a correlated and non-correlated metal, right? So I think uh, actually no. So I'm, I'm I'm actually sorry. So I mean, there is right. So there is uh, you you're correct. So basically, we we see uh, so there was this Pomeranchuk uh, effect observed by several groups uh, recently, right? Uh, and they, uh, they, their claim is that isospin fluctuations are really strong up to like 100 Kelvin. However, insulators, we form only below 10 Kelvin. So, so the correlations survive at much higher temperatures, but only the sort of hard, sharp insulating transport features we observe below 10 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, what I'm saying is also in this, in this uh, picture here, uh, even though the insulators disappear, doesn't mean that the correlations are gone. I, I also have a question. Does it matter the superconducting dome, especially on the negative filling factor side, has shifted from like it's almost shifted by one electron per cell? Does that matter at all, or do you think it's just the same type of superconductivity? Uh, yeah, so uh, somehow it twisted by there, we observed superconductors shifting shifting uh, back and forth. Uh, um, we don't know. I mean, our guess is it's some disorder, disorder-related thing potentially that that kind of shifts the position of them, but we were not exactly sure. So the, it's not, it's it's for sure not this ideal picture that, like 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 in this case where you have like two superconducting domes are sharply symmetric around the uh, insulator position. Uh, it's 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 typically a little more. Uh, wildly spread. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it could be related to some sort of disorder. Actually, in this new uh, mirror symmetric trilayer graphene, it seems to be much a much more stable phase diagram. So usually, uh, we also have some results now, but usually uh, the phase diagrams, which I've seen from colleagues, they're usually very robust. Whereas in twisted bilayer, they, they're kind of uh, a little bit disordered, I would say. Yeah, okay, good. I was going to ask another question about that, which is exactly that. If you if you took a different sample and looked at these same numbers that you're showing us, HBN thickness and twist angle, would you see the same phase diagram or not really? Well, not necessarily, no, because yeah, okay. I mean, well, okay, so hitting the exactly same parameters is already pretty hard because, you know, uh, we don't control the, these parameters uh, right. too well experimentally. Uh, but the but uh, but also what we know matters a lot is twist angle disorder, strain profiles, um, percolation paths. Because these superconductors are not homogeneous, there there are also maybe some different percolation paths uh, for these. So uh, that's why actually we form Josephson junctions in devices where there are no there are supposedly no Josephson junctions. So the systems are very disordered. So. Um, so I, my, my guess is that this trilayer system is maybe a little bit more stable because somehow the top, the extra layer of gra graphene, it kind of stabilizes these, uh, these inhomogeneities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but this is just a guess at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I can move on from uh, the, this um, part of the talk to, to, to topological properties. Uh, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll just do that. So, uh, and sort of uh, another um, sort of aspect again uh, about this system which excited everybody is that again, uh, we have strong correlations, we have superconductivity, but also as I will show in a second, we, are, we all are convinced now that we have also uh, uh, non-trivial topological properties. And I think um, if you talk to Ali Azdani or so, they were really excited that they have now a topological system with interactions because typically uh, that's not really, um, that's, not, that's, that's a rather exo exotic combination as far as I understand. And, and so basically there were, um, as I mentioned in, in the introduction, so uh, people define, uh, uh, if people look at sort of the, the winding numbers, uh, so there were many groups, uh, Oscar Rafeg, Andre Brnovic, Ashwin Lishnawan, who really looked at those properties in more details. They typically uh, find that uh, the brilliant zones have a non-zero helicity of uh, plus two and minus two in the different brilliant zones. 
And this is a, a very much uh, different, uh, this is very different from a single layer graphene case where the winding numbers is just zero. And therefore, uh, uh, it's impossible to find localized binary function from the system. And really, what uh, people uh, are now uh, using is sort of the, the ground state for uh, the, uh, uh, the description of, of these bands uh, are uh, basically uh, uh, sort of uh, churn bands. And uh, basically, if one looks at different orbitals, depending on what kind of sublet is, belly, uh, and, and spin uh, this, this orbital has, one can define uh, basically uh, four bands with churn number of minus one. And so basically, these are these, are these combinations. Uh, and four bands of churn number plus one. And uh, really, uh, in a normal situation, all these bands are, of course, perfectly degenerate. They have the same energy. And the total added up churn number is still zero. And then, therefore, no, topo no chance to observe this sort of underlying topo topology uh, here. However, of course, um, in graphene, uh, one can play tricks. One can try to reduce gaps uh, and to gap out these different uh, churn bands. Uh, and for this, of course, uh, one needs to break uh, C2T symmetry uh, one way or the other. And uh, for example, the groups of uh, uh, David Gold, Robert Gordon, and Andrea Young, they broke C2 symmetry by aligning graphene to HPN. And uh, the HPN substrate basically uh, breaks inversion symmetry uh, on a single particle level. Uh, and of course, uh, one can uh, try to sort of uh, break time reversal by applying magnetic fields. And also, of course, another possibility is that interactions somehow break those symmetries by itself. And I will so, sort of uh, talk along uh, the lines uh, of interaction uh, broken uh, C2D symmetry. Uh, and so uh, basically, the, the first experimental features which uh, we started observing, and uh, many other groups uh, at the same time uh, start observing too, is uh, people start again applying um, a perpendicular magnetic fields to somehow induce some sort of time reversal symmetry breaking in the system. And those were, again, prominently Ali Azdani, Andrea Young, Eva Andre, Pablo Ferrero, who uh, uh, last summer observed very similar results. And uh, really, the experimentally striking feature is that we observe uh, churn insulators uh, from, uh, which originate uh, from different uh, filling factors uh, uh, for meridian itself. So for example, here, um, uh, these uh, experimental features uh, uh, correspond to a sequence of churn insulators of uh, Churn number four, starting from charge neutrality, churn number three, starting from uh, filling factor one, and so on. So there's always a robust correspondence between churn number uh, and, and filling factor. Uh, and the, the reason um, uh, um, um, we kind of identify these type of experimental features uh, as uh, churn insulators is really that they follow this um, diagonal line in the uh, B to end the phase diagram, which is given by this uh, Strader formula. And of course, we measure quantized conductance uh, in the uh, whole measurements. So we can really uh, define a very robust churn number to each, uh, to each of those states. And uh, basically, uh, uh, the, the, the reason we also distinguish these states from uh, just lambda level quantization is because we also can extract the energy uh, gaps in this problem, and usually the energy gaps are an order of magnitude larger than uh, uh, for typical lambda levels. Also, the quantization fields are usually an order of magnitude lower. And I will show also in a second that uh, we also observe these uh, these states also in zero field. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, Basically, so let me uh, move on. So uh, basically, uh, really, uh, these states uh, can also appear, uh, as I mentioned, at zero field. So for example, in this particular device, uh, which we had, so this is a, a really uh, a, a device which is uh, very comparable to all other devices I showed. It shows superconducting phases. It shows uh, correlated uh, insulators. But it also shows in zero field, centered around the filling factor one, a uh, very strong hysteresis loop uh, if we measure RxY, uh, depending on the magnetic field direction. So there's clearly some magnetic state uh, which is formed uh, uh, around a filling factor of one. Uh, 
Uh, and this uh, magnetic state uh, um, uh, is identified by the cis loop, and it's almost quantized as well. So if you look uh, at the RxY value, which we obtained here, it really has a uh, almost uh, quantized uh, value of a churn number of one. And uh, basically, uh, what um, uh, uh, what uh, um, what uh, uh, we can uh, really um, um, uh, do uh, uh, so they, and basically so what uh, we can also uh, study in, in this type of um, uh, situation is we can also study the phase transitions which are going on in magnetic fields. So because for this particular case here, as I mentioned, we observe a, a magnetic state um, uh, with a churn number of, of, of one at zero field, but however, we go to higher magnetic fields, we, uh, we see that the state disappears and we go over to a, um, uh, again, to a churn number uh, um, uh, offering. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm a little fast right now. So I, I noticed I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, went to a different topic, but let me, let me just uh, basically uh, explain a little bit uh, better what, what is this sort of theoretical uh, picture uh, which uh, we are uh, uh, dealing with here. And so here I will just paraphrase um, sort of the work uh, by our collaborator, Andre Bernovic, who has uh, done a uh, careful uh, analysis, theoretical analysis of the magnetic uh, phase diagram in the system. And so basically what's, uh, what, what they're predicting is that just by uh, taking time reversal symmetry breaking uh, into consideration, uh, which arises from interactions alone, they can really define a very complex uh, phase diagram uh, for, uh, uh, for a twisted battery routine. And what they find is that really that at um, um, uh, zero magnetic field, the system is highly, uh, 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 there are a lot of competing states. So it's really hard to define which uh, ground state wins, but in, in their scenario, uh, they uh, can find that really um, um, odd integer filling factors in zero field are partially integrally coherent uh, states, uh, which have a non-zero churn numbers of plus or minus one. So this is what they find. However, the um, inter uh, so the, the however the uh, um, even integer filling factors like minus two and plus two they're intervalic coherent states with churn number two. So this is uh, this is sort of the ground state. However, magnetic field strongly couples to the churn numbers here, and magnetic field uh, uh, couples strongest to the stronger churn numbers. So each of these states kind of goes over to a belly polarized. A state with a maximal possible churn number, and uh, therefore at uh, these uh, higher fields uh, we um, observe uh, these uh, very polarized states. And really, this is going back to sort of our phase diagram here. This is really uh, what we observe in our measurements. So really, at zero field, we get these uh, low churn number states with churn number one, uh, which are given by this type of sort of uh, schematic, where we assume a partially intervalic coherent state. And then if we increase the magnetic field, then uh, this couples strongest to the, to the higher chart numbers, and we obtain a valley polarized state with, a, uh, with basically where one valley uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, different, is basically uh, polarized with respect to the other, and therefore we also uh, have really strong contribution of orbital paramagnetism uh, in, in this problem. Okay, uh, and with this, I think I, I'll try to slowly uh, wrap up. So I think uh, one thing I also want to mention is uh, that these devices, um, they're also um, uh, uh, extremely interesting for future Josephson junction um, uh, manipulations. So that these devices, which I just showed, they're, they're really um, devices where you can tunably switch from superconducting to magnetic phases. So basically, you, you can uh, uh, gate tunably create now Joseph junctions uh, between superconducting states uh, and uh, ferromagnetic and topological states. And in principle, I think we're, we're quite excited to uh, do experiments um, and to, to, um, to hybridize these states. And uh, in principle, this is also an avenue uh, potentially for, for Majorana for new creation uh, in the future. And with this, I think uh, uh, I want to slowly wrap up. I think 
uh, I want to thank uh, my group uh, for um, uh, their wonderful work, and I want to uh, thank you for, for your attention. Great, thanks, Dimitri. Um, that was super interesting. Are, are there questions? And I also, maybe I can start with a question about what you were just talking about. Are there, um, are there any signatures you can observe for these inter-valley coherent states? Or you know, is the main signature just watching the churn number change? Um, right, so, uh, right, so I mean, um, so your, your question is whether can we can, what, what is experimental probe to test uh, one of the versus the other? Yeah. Uh, right, yeah, that's a good question. So we, yeah, in transport, again, in transport, I think uh, it's really hard to know. Uh, probably in um, uh, in STM, uh, maybe this is something uh, which which they can address uh, in a better way because they might might uh, potentially test different lattice sites uh, and to see whether there's some asymmetry between them. But uh, right in transport, we we're not 100 percent sure uh, how to do it. There was a paper by uh, Jason Alexia, I think recently they proposed uh, to. Uh, in JJ experiments to distinguish these uh, these states, but uh, uh, yeah, I have to read that paper, uh, paper a little bit more carefully. But in transport, in sort of this type of transport that I showed here, it's 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 hard. It's actually very hard to do. I think. <clears throat> yeah, makes sense. Antoine, did you have a question? Yes, I, I do have a question. I was intrigued to see uh, Dmitry that on your last slide. You acknowledge uh, Felix Baumberger. So, is there any uh, hope, or maybe already Rachel's doing photo emission on this, on these devices? Right. Yeah. So, I, I actually this was one of my first slides. So, we already did that with Felix. I that so one. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, right. So, so this is photo emission uh, performed by Felix on our devices. So, they clearly they were clearly able to resolve uh, the flat bands. However, as you see, it's a relatively blurry, right? So um, I think um, the two challenges, so first of all, the devices are very small. And so sort of it's hard for them to uh, get a really good energy resolution. I think that, I think uh, when I talk to Felix, the best possible uh, energy resolution they can get is maybe three milli electron volts. Yeah. And the bandwidth here is 10 milli electron volts. Hmm. So yeah, then, sure. it's very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. So then getting like fine structure and interaction effects in the bench, it's maybe uh, extremely uh, pushing, really pushing the limit there. Yeah, but it's beautiful that this is coming up. It's great. But it's also, uh, also what's uh, really uh, also the sort of the Fermi surface uh, reconstruction, they, they, can, they can get really a nice. Um, Comparisons to to the band structure populations. Okay, thank you. I have another question, which is um, going a little bit beyond what you were talking about, but I was looking at your papers earlier, um, and my question is. Uh, this is all about the first magic angle, but um, you also looked a bit at the second magic angle, and right. I know it, that is a lot harder to access. So my question is, what do you see at the second magic angle? How does it compare to the first magic angle? I mean, so, um, right, so we were, when we started the work, we hoped to see uh, interaction effects in the second magic angle as well. So we, we, we didn't see it as really smoking gun evidence of interactions. I think uh, whatever we saw was, secondary sort of uh, comparisons. So actually Andre uh, Bernovic, uh, they did the, the calculations there. And really what our sort of features kind of matched best sort of an interaction model. However, uh, it was not so striking as observing correlated insulators like in the magic and routine case. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is of course, all these topological properties, which I talked about, uh, they're also true for um, for these uh, smaller twist angle devices. Uh, and there, what we were predominantly interested in in the Hofstadter physics, because uh, there were some predictions that also Hofstadter 
in, uh, butterflies are uh, distinct in these topological systems than uh, as compared to uh, normal systems. Uh, and the, the advantage of uh, small twist angle graphene is that the unit cell is much bigger and therefore you need a much smaller magnetic field to create a Hofstadter. So you get already a Hofstadter full, full flux uh, to the Hofstadter at very few, few Tesla. Um, so that's, that's what we studied. But it's, it's, it's uh, uh, I think I would say, so the topological properties are very similar to magic graphene, but all the interaction physics is, is not, not as well pronounced. Yeah. How do you, um, is there a big fear of twist angle disorder at the very small angles? Um, yeah. It's, uh, and uh, strain effects, lettuce, uh, uh, um, so corrugation effects, et cetera, are uh, in principle more pronounced in smaller twist angles. Also, of course, in a small twist angle, the lattice size is even larger, so therefore interactions are even, you know, the, 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 the electrons are further apart, so interactions are weaker in principle just by mm -hmm. that argument. So I think, I think uh, honestly, so I think uh, if people uh, uh, want to enhance interactions, they, they kind of go rather, they want to rather increase the magic angle. They want to go to maybe a two degrees into the system uh, where, where uh, where uh, sort of flat bands are formed at two degrees. Then, then the lattice constants are smaller and then the interactions could be actually even stronger. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and sorry, and this is also the case in uh, mirror symmetric trilayer. Right. Right, it has a, a, a twist and magic angle of around 1.6 degrees. Um, so in principle, this is, this is going the, 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 the more, more the, the right direction there. Are you guys looking at trilayer also? Uh, yeah, we have some. We also, yeah. yeah. It's it's it, it, it seems to be a more robust system. Maybe it's actually, but maybe it's also more complicated. So we're there. There must be some trade off. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Maybe I can ask another question then also, which is what's the maximum number of layers that you're conceivably thinking about um, stacking or is tri-layer the limit that's actually gonna give you nice, nice results with low disorder? Um, so uh, I think uh, I was actually surprised how easy it is to make trilayers. So I think first of all, you know, so first it was too hard to be true to make two layers, uh, and then actually trilayer was actually uh, almost easier to make. Um, so I would, I would, I, I, we're not so, you're not too afraid to make four layers or probably five layers now. Uh, but I think what one needs to be careful about, I think. Uh, there is still a, there is still maybe a second moray lattice, a larger moray lattice formed between the bottom and the third layer, and this sort of this is this type of disorder would just grow by when you add each layer. So, um, so it's not clear how far you can actually push this this whole with all these ideas. Yeah. Good. Jen, can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, sorry. So, in the tri layer, what's the. Yeah, hey. Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> sorry. Uh, following you everywhere. Um, what's the. Uh, in the tri layer, you were mentioning. Uh, so, this is actually related to Jen's question also. Um, um, you're mentioning it's more robust, but mm -hmm. uh, more complicated. So, does, so what's the angle disorder there? Is that the reason for robustness? It's, it's, a, it's a larger angle, right? Like the magic angle is larger by, I guess, square root of two or something. Right. So, is that, so do you have, I mean, you don't have access to know what the angle disorder is there, right? Or right, so, so uh, I, you probably know of some uh, STM experiments on the system. 
Uh, so, I, I don't. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so and he doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, but I, I, you know, so basically, so uh, I would say, so uh, uh, what is striking is that uh, the different base diagrams I've seen so far by the group of Philip Kim, by Pablo's group, also comparing the results to our group, the base diagrams look almost identical. And even though the twist angles were not exactly the same. So somehow, and, and, and this is to con in contrast to a twisted bilayer where I mentioned sort of somehow the phase diagrams were totally different. This was kind of shocking to see. So somehow there is some, something about that system which is a little bit uh, more robust. Uh, the phase diagrams at least come out the same way. So what, what uh, angles are you, what angles are you looking at? 1.57 or so, one point, yeah, very, very close to Pablo's results. And I think, um, and I think uh, also in their case, I think they have several devices now measured up, but I think in their case, it's also seems to be, the face diagram seems to be a little more robust. Uh, however, I also heard of um, uh, STM experiments, I think, where really it's not true. So, so the top layer and the, and, and the bottom layer and the top layer, they, they, they are supposed to be AB, a, a, a stack, right? They're supposed to be perfectly AA stack. And that, that is, you know, that would be fantastic uh, if that would be true, because then somehow these top and bottom layers that stabilize each other. Uh, but uh, apparently that's not exactly true. So there is, there is a different twist angle between each, each layer. Um, so that, so I don't know, I don't know what, what to do about this information at this point. Okay, thanks. Yeah.